All right, we're going get, to we'll get started if uh, folks outside can find a seat. My name is Errol Yabake. Uh, I am uh, the Deputy Director and a Research Fellow with the Project on Prosperity and Development here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you for coming out on a somewhat dark and dreary uh, afternoon to um, hear our discussion on travel and tourism as a strategic sector for development and security. We're really excited about this panel. We just spent about uh, 45 minutes in the green room back there, and I haven't laughed that hard in a while, so not to set unrealistic expectations for, for this panel, but um, we're really excited. There's, there's an incredible wealth of knowledge on a topic that, in my opinion, is wholly undercovered. Uh, so we're hoping that by doing this event, we do cover some of the things that should be part of a broader strategy conversation, that should be part of a broader development conversation. So we're very happy that you're all here. We're hoping to get uh, to your questions uh, at the end of this event, uh, towards the end, the last 10 or 15 minutes. So as things go along, as the conversation progresses, please be uh, thinking about how um, you want to contribute at the, at the very end. Uh, I'm. I think I need to tell everyone that bathrooms are out there um, to the right and that the emergency exit is just down the stairs in the, uh, the front door that you probably came in. So you're probably wondering what we're doing and why we're doing this particular topic. And I'm not going to necessarily answer that question myself. But I will tell you that I study international development and have worked in and around the world. Um, but I actually, my, my father, who is watching the live stream right now from Austin, Texas, uh, was a hotel manager. And so I grew up in and around hotels, um, getting to know housekeepers and assistant general managers and front desk managers and night managers, and being that annoying little kid that was running around everywhere in the lobby. Um, I didn't really think about my time growing up as, as being as formative as it ended up being for me. And I've thought about this idea of, you know, hotels and travel and tourism is not just something that we use when we go somewhere to study something else or to have business, but it's actually a driver of growth. It's actually a, a strategically important sector. I hadn't really thought about that uh, until just a few months ago. Um, and. Thankfully, there are much smarter people than I who have been thinking about this and are uh, on the cusp of taking this conversation to the next level. So with that, I, I'm going to um, turn it over to Helen. And let me get my notes. So we're really excited to have uh, Helen Morano here. Helen is the Executive Vice President for External Affairs at the World Travel and Tourism Council. Um, she's been there since 2012 and has really been uh, just a seasoned leader and, and a driver of change in this industry for a long time. She previously led the National Travel and Tourism Office of the United States here at CSIS. We love to think about foreign policy from a U.S. perspective. We're really hoping to get that uh, from Helen. And she's been uh, just on the forefront of thinking about things that we all know, but maybe not, didn't know that we knew, like Brand USA. Um, and so we're really excited to have here. And so Helen, maybe I'll just kick it over to you and say, can you can you frame this um, travel and tourism as a development issue in, in a global perspective for us? Thank you. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, mostly to be surrounded by people who know a lot more than I do. <laughs> and for whom uh, many countries benefit from their good work. Uh, I actually, um, from the World Travel and Tourism Council, is a private sector organization comprised of the leading organizations or companies uh, that produce travel and tourism, from the hotels to the rental cars all the way to the um, online travel agencies. And think of the spectrum and your journey from a cruise line to an airline. And we're it, and we have 160 members that are probably 80% of the revenues that are generated for this industry. Well, in that, the basis is based, um, to be able to size the industry so that the policymakers really understand the serious nature of travel and tourism. It's certainly comprised of many segments for this sector. 
And uh, from a world perspective, it is 10.2% of the global GDP, both direct, indirect, and induced. It's 9.6% um, uh, of jobs across the world. So it's 292 million jobs are supported by travel and tourism. So we believe in the facts that tell the story itself and frame it. In, t in relation to export, it's 6.6 percent of global exports, a lot higher as in the United States than many others. But in the United States, it's the top services export. So this is to be recognized and understood, the kind of benefits that this brings economically. And for the money, honey, um, we have. <laughs> For the money, honey, <laughs> World Bank, um, it's <laughs> you can't have it. uh, well. It's already 6.6 percent of all the investments uh, globally are dedicated to travel and tourism. So I bring this out because most people think of the number of travelers, 1.3 billion in 2016, and uh, what's expected to uh, more than almost double to 1.8 billion um, in by the time arrivals, they call them international travelers by uh, the time of 2030. So we have a challenge. And we have a challenge more in communicating that that's the, that's the good, hard facts, but what are the social benefits? And that's what I think Hannah might be bringing out in a minute. But I will say that the message that we would bring forward is that this contributes so much to the community, to both in development and in raising up standard of livings and being part of a community pride to show off what they have, what their culture is, and not as a showmanship, but more to share. And it's that cross-cultural understanding that is vital, particularly in this geopolitical atmosphere that we're in across the world, to be able to, in the essence, at the end of the day, to bring a better understanding, appreciation, and peace. So that's the end of my statement. I'll go now. <laughs> you said you didn't have a prepared statement, but that was, uh, that was pretty impressive. It's, so. it's my passion in my head, so. <laughs> You think about this a lot more than, than some of us uh, do. So with that uh, really great global overview, I want to turn it over to um, Dr. Hannah Messerly. From, uh, she is the Eisenhower Profes uh, Professor of Tourism Studies uh, and the chair of the International Institute of Tourism Studies at the George Washington University. Uh, much like the other panelists, you have incredible experience uh, developing tourism private sector capacity in countries across Asia, Africa, Europe, the Middle East, and America. I'm not sure that there's anywhere in the world that you haven't worked and thought about these issues in. Um, so I, I'm going to ask a very similar question to you to put this in a global context, but ask you if you can talk a little bit more about the development implications of the travel and tourism industry. Thanks, Errol, and welcome to all of you. Great to see you here today. It's a pleasure for me to be here and, again, share my passion. Uh, Helen and I uh, compete on who's more passionate, but we won't get you excited before this is all over. Look, a couple of things here. Um, I think that it's important to keep in mind that uh, 2017 was the uh, International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development, as designated by the UN, and that was a, a really important point in terms of recognizing across many sectors, across many organizations that Tourism is not just about having fun. I mean, it's great, we can all have fun, but it's also serious business, and it's a serious government policy that can make a difference uh, as it relates to development. The sector, though, has a number of um, unusual aspects. One of them is, is that it is perishable. If you don't sell that hotel room tonight, it's not there to be sold tomorrow. So that's something to be thoughtful of in terms of how can we really leverage the economic benefits of, of tourism. It's also consumed at the point of production, which is quite important when we look at, we think about typical exports, you know, they get sent off to a country after they've been uh, made and boxed and out the door, as opposed to the case of tourism where people come to uh, the tourism product or in many cases the tourism experience. That makes a big difference in how we manage and also the benefits. For many years, tourism was not thought of as an export and it is very much an export. 
Um, there's another perception that tourism is, is just a private sector activity, and as I think John will, will talk about in a little bit, it, it's really um, about public policy working with the business sector or, or public entities working with the business sector in order to implement changes that can contribute to development, and particularly development over time. One of the challenges with tourism is, is that it has some very immediate impacts, which everyone gets excited about because they can see people coming and getting off the plane, but it also can have some very long-term impacts if there is patience um, and a willingness to continue to support it over time. And as all of us know in the development community, that's, that's one of our challenges is to not just go for the, the short-term win, but to really look at the longer-term um, activities. So there's one other point, which is that there is huge potential for tourism to benefit large numbers of people across different cultures at different points in their economic development. Uh, we see um, more and more uh, people traveling from developing or emerging economies into other um, economies, which is a great uh, change and a great uh, move forward, as well as obviously those from developed economies traveling um, all over. And then the one last comment I wanted to make is that tourism can both uh, strengthen rural communities as well as help um, regenerate urban environments. And it's, it's sometimes tricky and messy to measure and track, but nonetheless it can have a tremendous impact both on physical infrastructure but also on um, social communities, their awareness, and, and certainly pride in, in their own culture and, and location. Thank you. Excellent. I think there's a lot more there, and we're, we're not going to let you get off that easily as we get into question and answer, because I think there's, um, I, I just myself was thinking of two or three follow-up questions from what you said, so uh, really excited to unpack a little bit more of that. Uh, I want to turn to um, John Perotet. Did I, did I pronounce that correctly, John? Pre Took me a while to get it right. A perote is the word. Perote, <laughs> excellent. Well, you're an Australian guy, and you have the T silent, so it's a, it's confusing. <laughs> it, it's it's a very global name. Uh, excellent. So John is a he's a senior tourism specialist uh, in the finance competitiveness and innovation global practice at the World Bank. It's a very long title. Uh, you must have a very robust business card, uh, John. You have really helped um, governments and industries work together, uh, building competitive and attractive investment environments, and mobilizing the investment needed to, to build competitive, sustainable, and inclusive destinations, uh, which deliver quality jobs and incomes. All that's really interesting, but, but John, you're here representing the World Bank Group, and that industry solutions, finance, competitiveness, and innovation global practice is a really key part of the World Bank. Why is the World Bank interested in travel and tourism? Well, thanks, uh, Ron. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. It's great to be able to uh, share this passion that we all have. Um, but bankers are not kind of used to being considered as passionate people. <laughs> Whilst I've spent all my life pretty much working in tourism, I have developed that passion, but I've been told that I have to talk about that without the passion. So, <laughs> No, no, passion is fine. We're, we're, we're good with passion, too. <laughs> so why is the World Bank involved in tourism? Well, you know, there are lots of options for the bank to, to engage with their client countries in relation to economic development. As you know, the, the, the bank's objectives, you know, is pretty clear, alleviating poverty and boosting shared prosperity. Why choose tourism to do that? And to be frank, this is a kind of discussion that people like me have almost every day with the kind of country managers, the people who are delivering the money to our clients. Uh, they ask us, well, why should I do tourism? You know, um, I've got five projects here. They're all to do with, um, you know, e education or I've got uh, three or four uh, hydroelectric power uh, projects in, in Nepal. Which one of those do you think I should drop to do tourism? Uh, don't you like electric light? Don't you think that our clients should uh, be able to have access to good education and health? And the reality is that's a pretty difficult argument to, to run. You know, at some point you have to be able to sort of put some numbers on the table. And you've heard some of the numbers today and the, and the bank, you know, I think over a long period of time has waxed and waned in its interest in tourism. Uh, but the reality is that you can't run away from those numbers. Eventually you realise that the, all of these jobs uh, are the things that our clients want. They want foreign exchange. 47 of the 50 least developed countries 
tourism generates the largest quantum of foreign exchange in that country, those countries. So think about your own household. You have no income. You're not going to be able to invest in anything. You're not going to be able to send your kids to school. You can't feed and clothe them. So this is a very critical element of economic development, and the bank has kind of recognised this. And it's not that the bank, you know, has, uh, has, has not been in tourism before. We, we spent a lot of time in the early 70s, you know, working with countries to develop, you know, key destinations, whether it was in the Dominican Republic or Bali or various places around the world, Punta Cana. But I think uh, the, the, the kind of industry is complicated. Um, when you get down to getting back to the sort of dispassionate banking kind of criteria, it's hard to measure the benefits, in fact, from a lending point of view. That's not to say that there aren't any. They're overwhelmingly obvious, of course, to most of us, but no, most of us aren't economists. So we have to kind of find a way in which to convince you know, those kind of powers that this is actually a good outcome. And because of the complexities in tourism, that's not an easy thing. So I think over the years, you know, the tourism's kind of lost its luster in, in the bank. It's recovered from that. I think in recent years there's been a resurgent and a lot of resurgence, and a lot of that is, is due to some of the work of the people actually sitting at this table, mm -hmm. because this whole question of advocacy uh, has become a very important part of the bank's response. And uh, within the bank itself, we now kind of look at tourism. You know, if you want to be successful in this, from uh, our point of view, there are kind of three three words that we're kind of using at the moment. One of them is that we have to elevate the discussion in tourism from ministers of tourism and people on the ground to ministers of finance, our kind of normal client, because they are the only people who can bring these parties together. Uh, we have to integrate the, the offer in, in tourism because it is complex and we have to be able to find tools to, to work across different sectors of the economy, across different ministries. That is a very complicated process and many of our clients are asking for exactly that help. I'm working in Indonesia at the moment you know, they have a $4 billion tourism development program. We're going to lend them some money, but the money we're going to lend them is relatively minor, maybe a couple of hundred million dollars. Sounds like a lot of money. But in $4 billion, it's not a lot. That's not why they're talking to the World Bank. They have $4 billion that they're allocating of their own tax dollars. Correct. To developing this industry and diversifying away from Bali as the kind of number one destination. Too. Yeah, well, they've got a lot of product, um, <laughs> but a lot of you know a lot of barriers. We can we can talk about individual transactions, but I think this important point is that in a in a country like that, it's a fantastic example of just how complex trying to deliver a four billion dollar program could be. Mm -hmm. A lot of geographic challenges, uh, you know, a relatively recently diversified uh, political economy. How do you integrate a horizontally across the ministries? They have enough trouble doing that themselves. As you know, in Indonesia, there are these super ministries whose job it is is to do exactly that, try to integrate. But when you get to the reality, some of those uh, operating ministries are in different political parties. They're in different super ministries. You know, it's a, it's a challenging task. And in a sense, that's part of the role of the bank is to kind of come in and try to work them through that process. And, uh, and the third word is, uh, we said, integrate, elevate, and the other is this advocate. We have, to, we have to be at the table with these colleagues of ours here to make sure that people realise how serious it is, that it can be a, a, you know, a, a force for good, but it needs to be managed properly. And I think, uh, that, again, one of the roles of the bank here is, is very much in helping manage that process, whether it's managing environmental impacts, managing uh, cultural impacts, there's a lot to do in that space, and people are starting to realise that the risks that they're running in going down this path, it's not as simple as, you know, the more visitors, the better. If it were all as simple as the more visitors, the better, then um, CSIS probably wouldn't have a reason to exist. So it's, you know, the reality is a uh, lot more complicated. We live in a world that's shades of grey. So um, I really appreciated that, that framing, and my follow-up question was going to be, okay, how do you convince the bakers, bankers um, to, be, to care about this? But luckily you, you went into that, um, and that may be something that our audience and, and other people will want to dig in uh, a little bit later, because getting people to understand the realities of how important and strategic this sector is, um, is what will take some time and, and um, wordsmithing and finding the, the way to get the finance people, the ministers of finance to care along with the ministers of tourism. So um, I'm going to move on to Chris Seek, who is president and CEO of Solomar uh, International. And Solomar, if you don't know, is one of the world's leading sustainable tourism and development firms. So all of this stuff that we've been talking about in the abstract, <clears throat> 
Chris actually does it on the ground uh, and in a panel full of incredible um, field experience and, and work on the ground, Chris I think stands out as someone who's really been there and, and done that. Um, so, you know, you've done, you've worked with over 50 tourism destinations. So countries themselves from Bhutan to Nepal to Georgia, not the state. Um, and, you know, a thousand tourism enterprises to develop and market uh, visitor experiences. And you focus on conservation and biodiversity and cultural heritage and all that thing. Um, so you're also an executive in residence, also at the George Washington University. So we've got two GW folks um, here on the on the panel, which is exciting. So, Chris, you know, from a from a on the ground field perspective, reflect on what you've heard from these other folks, and and how is travel and tourism being used as a as a really tool for development on the ground? Sure. Thanks. Um, you know, I, I definitely do think I have one of the, the best jobs up here on the table, even though everyone's got a passion for travel and tourism. I actually get to work on the ground with the local um, project stakeholders who are using tourism directly as a tool for development. Um, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about how tourism can be used as a tool, but it's really folks like John and, and that are out there designing projects who understand and can put the pieces together to say, okay, well, if we do these three things, then all of a sudden we can create more jobs and lift people out of poverty and s support the conservation of those resources. So I've had the pl pleasure of working, like you said, I think I need to update that bio. I think we're now over 100 different projects now in, in about 50 different countries. Um, and what, what's in common of all of our projects is we're not just being asked to just grow tourism. Very rarely does someone come to us and say, hey, can you help us grow tourism? They're, they're coming to us because they see tourism as an opportunity to achieve another development objective. Um, we've worked in Uganda where USAID um, and, and some of the conservation organizations there recognize that the biggest threat to biodiversity around along the Albertine Rift was in fact the communities that were living next to those parks. And they, the reason why they were the biggest threat was because they were trying to put food on the table. So they recognized with all this tourism taking place in and around these communities, well how do we let them benefit? How do they benefit from tourism? And so we were asked to go in there and what we did is we sat down with the private sector, the lodge owners, the tour operators and said, hey, by the way, do you know your guests would love to have an experience with local communities? And this community over here, this Batawa community, they have these great traditions and, and stories and we're going to help train them and get them ready to be able to provide a great experience if you're willing to help introduce your guests to that experience. And they saw that as a win-win. We partnered together and we were able to lift about 50 different community enterprises into the tourism value chain. And now those communities directly understand the importance of protecting that resource. So not only are they directly making sure that, that they're not causing a threat, but they have influence over the gr broader community. That's how they're making a living now. Don't you dare go in and poach that animal and things like that. Yeah. So we see that in conservation. I've seen it in cultural heritage as well. You mentioned Bhutan. That was a fascinating project with the World Bank, where again, Bhutan, many people don't realize, is one of the fastest rural to urban migrations on the planet. Right now, every, there are a lot of rural communities, this new generation, the kids are, everyone wants their kids to have a, 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 the university education, so they're all going to the capital, and they're looking for work, but there's not enough private sector to absorb all of these, these graduates. So you've got this opportunity where you have these rural villages and this cultural heritage that's rich and, and important to the country and to the people, but how does tourism develop in such a way that people stay with those communities and with those families and they maintain those traditional uh, um, houses and, and practices? So these are the kind of questions we'll be asked to do. And it's, it's fascinating, it's, it's environment, it's, it's culture. Um, in Colombia, we've been working on a project there in the Choco region where you had a former kind of conflict area where a lot of narco traffic, um, but amazing, rich, beautiful beaches, amazing biodiversity, and yet with a little bit of support from USAID, combined with the uh, Ministry of Tourism and also the Ministry of Environment in Colombia, all of a sudden now these communities are getting supported and getting products developed and integrated into the tourism value chain, and now all of a sudden this community is one of the hot, most, you know, the, the hottest new destination in all of Colombia. So there are some fantastic examples of when tourism, when done the right way, can actually achieve development objectives, but at the same time, as you also pointed out, there's also when you're not managing tourism and you're kind of asleep at the wheel, tourism can actually destroy a place and the people who live there. So that's why you know it's exciting to have the opportunity to work on the, uh, on the ground level on these different projects. But again, there's this kind of piece of it of thinking: how do we harness tourism? How do we create the right policy to make sure that tourism is supporting our, our development objectives instead of just letting it happen? 
You mean tourism doesn't just happen? Uh, it, you, you actually, <laughs> uh, you, that, wow, you gave us a lot to think about there. Um, and a lot of really good examples. I think uh, we'll probably come back to you, Chris, to, to really dig in on some of those um, examples, especially when it comes to the challenges. You know, we always talk about, um, we at the Project on Prosperity and Development like to talk about what the potential is and what the positive, you know, switch the conversation from burden to opportunity, those types of things. Um, but in this, like you mentioned, if it's not done well, it could really have long lasting and devastating impacts, uh, not just on the environment, not just on culture and heritage, but on economies uh, when those things go away. So. Yeah, use your mic. Yeah. And actually on the community itself. So this has become a burgeoning issue. The media loves it. But the overcrowding or over-tourism uh, is indeed a concern, and that's why I appreciated the development of tourism with the managed con con uh, construct. Because uh, once it's let loose, um, and people want the tourism to come in to help, but all of a sudden they don't know, oh my gosh, we're so successful, look what's happened. So we have in Barcelona, uh, go away tourists. Uh, we have uh, Machu Picchu who had to install some um, controls in order to protect what is so incredible and awe-inspiring. So there are definite areas that have not really paid attention and now it's the residents that feel pushed out, and Venice is another good example. And some of the products that we bring to, or concept of products, like the cruise ships, for instance, in Venice, has been a, a yin and a yang. And now they're being able to, I don't know which is the better, the yang or the yang, so. <laughs> um, but now they're working on managing that. And I think that, uh, I think it's a real challenge for us, and it's the downside, and, they, and we are accused of polluting the environment, the climate change issue, we're adding to the carbon emissions, et cetera. But the industry has come together to try to address this as well, and we have to continue our due diligence and the passion to make sure that we don't destroy what we have, but that the community is engaged enough to help us find those solutions, not just the companies. And hopefully we can stop Venice from sinking uh, along the way. That would be nice. Um, so several months ago, Isabel Hill, uh, we, we had a conversation with you about how this is, there are incredible uh, travel and tourism implications for, uh, or development implications to travel and tourism. But Isabel, she is at the, um, she's the director of the National Travel and Tourism Office at the United States Department of Commerce, and Isabel said it's bigger than that. It's, there's a strategic level conversation that needs to be ha happening that's, that's not happening, and I can't think of a better person than Isabel to help us have that conversation. Um, she has among other incredible things, you were part of the Civilian Response Corps, you trained at the National Defense University as a planner for reconstruction and stabilization. You were one of uh, very few civilians to participate in war games um, and other things that we think a lot about here at, at CSIS. You've, you've thought about the role of travel and tourism as a source of economic stability and resiliency which is slightly different than the conversation that we've had um, so far, but I think takes it into this conversation of fragile states and really um, moving the conversation from just a purely you know, development one to one that actually could have really strategic implications on fragile states. So Isabel, tell us a little bit about why you came to us on this and, and our conversation, just summarize those a little bit and, and frame the strategic picture a little bit for us. Uh, certainly. Um, actually, it was Dan Rundy that came to me, but um, glad to. But We're going go to go to Dan started, right after this. So <laughs> to have started this conversation because um, uh, this is sort of the volunteer side of of what I do in my day job, uh, which is to lead the United States Travel and Tourism Office. Uh, but I began to uh, notice a few things in the world around me, which I'm sure many of you have noticed as well, and in the travel and tourism space in particular. I began to notice a lot of what the panel has been talking about, which is the role of travel and tourism in, uh, in lesser developed economies, how dependent they are, um, and how, uh, as a tool, this really can help 
their economies, which is very important when you're talking about stability. You know, our first goal is to avoid conflict. Um, and so, you know, economic development, the role of travel and tourism in employing youth and things along those lines, I think is a very important uh, part of this conversation. But I also began to notice some other things going on. And uh, in particular, I began to notice how some other countries, most notably China, uh, was approaching their travel and tourism sector. Um, China had identified, tra has identified travel and tourism as a strategic sector. Um, and when they call it a strategic sector, they mean something somewhat different and practice it somewhat more uh, uh, di differently than most of us do in the developed world where we are looking at the inbound tourism part. And um, China has begun to use tourism as part of the development of the Silk Road. Uh, it's a very strong component of the Silk Road uh, 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 project, uh, and it has some very interesting benefits. Um, I think we are all uh, familiar with the Silk Road and the countries uh, that cross the Silk Road and their uh, strategic position uh, globally, um, geographically. And one of the things that China does is that they use both uh, tourism, both as, with respect to growing their own economy, but they also use outbound tourism and their development as a way of growing the economies of those uh, states that they would like to um, you know, maintain strong alliances with. Um, and so I noticed the development of the Silk Road and that the infrastructure development that they were uh, doing was supporting travel and tourism, that they were using travel and tourism also um, from a diplomatic standpoint to bring people together uh, in terms of the cultural connectiveness between China and those um, cultures. And I noticed also that this didn't extend only to the um, uh, land uh, road. They also are using the maritime. Uh, Silk Road, which connects, as you know, all the way from uh, uh, Europe down through uh, Africa over to Ind Indonesia and then to the South China Sea, where uh, they are in the process of developing a number of tourism attractions and promoting uh, the uh, cruise line industry and whatnot. Um, so I, I just couldn't help but notice um, that there were some very interesting developments uh, in the use of travel and tourism uh, from, uh, from China. Um, and so when the opportunity came uh, for the, uh, the um, Civilian Response Corps, the Civilian Response Corps was an experiment between the Department of Defense and the, the um, civilian agencies to see how we could respond to win the peace as well as the war. Uh, because perhaps we had not um, done that as effectively as possible. And so the question there is, um, how, do you, how do you use travel and tourism uh, as a source of resilience in post-conflict environments. And I think a number of examples have been brought up here and we can talk about those more specifically, uh, referencing Colombia, looking at Rwanda, and, and I think we can get into some of those examples more, more specifically. Um, but I think that one of the things that, um, uh, when I went to Warfighter 3, I went down to Fort Hood for uh, uh, several weeks and, um, and joined their planning cell as part of this experiment. And uh, as we were looking uh, at, at this whole question, I, I learned that as part of this experiment, I got to go talk to all of the cells. I got to go look at what the humanitarian cells were doing and what all these other components were doing. So that led me, uh, much to their surprise, to the targeting cell. Uh, because it is also clear that in the winning of the peace and the use of travel and tourism as a strategic tool for resiliency, there are assets that must be preserved, that must be recognized, and must be integrated into uh, the planning of uh, what they refer to as kinetic environments. Um, and that is to say that you know we can't have ransacking of the uh, of the museums where those things are being the, those artifacts are being stolen and in fact sold on the the black market in term for arms and other things. So not not helpful from any standpoint. Um, uh, the 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 Buyaman Buddhas, you know, uh, believe it or not, Afghanistan has a, a tourism economy still, uh, as does Iraq, which re relies very heavily on religious tourism. Um, 
but these, these uh, opportunities are lost if the culture and the heritage is not identified as a source of resilience and something that can be protected and preserved in those environments, not just protecting and preserving it from visitors, but using it and ensuring that we are protecting the long-standing cultural assets that these, uh, that these countries have. And as, as we win the peace, making sure that we are coming in very quickly and working with communities as to how they can leverage those assets and their communities for economic benefit and sustainability. Um, so uh, much to their surprise, um, it was a very interesting conversation, a very interesting experiment. I'm sorry that the Civilian Response Corps is, uh, is, is no longer functioning. But I think one of the things that I took away from that was a very hopeful part of the conversation, which is when I was at the National Defense University working with our um, uh, military uh, counterparts and when I was actually in the, in the war games, um, th this is a community that is very open to these questions. They are, they are, they are really searching for that, that answer as to how, how can we, we, you know, we can't capture a country, win a war, and then come in the way we did in World War II. It's got to be a synchronous process that is planned. Um, so it was a great beginning of a conversation, and I appreciate CSIS uh, continuing to have that conversation here today. Uh, thanks, Isabel. I, I used to live 10 minutes from the ancient city of Babylon mm -hmm. in south central Iraq, and it, it heartens me to hear that the, that the military, DOD, and state, and other people have really kind of learned from that experience when uh, there was a little bit of destruction of the ancient city, and I think the U.S. government really acknowledged that um, and, and moved forward and had some State Department programming that, that really helped them build up their antiquities ministry and just did a lot of good that came out of a little bit of damage to an ancient site, but, you know, we wouldn't have to do that if we didn't damage the ancient site in the first place, so um, I, a lot of what you said there really resonated with me. So I want to get uh, to a few other questions, but if the panel will indulge me just for a second. Dan Rundy is our director of uh, uh, the Project on Prosperity and Development and was really a driver of, of putting this event together. And so I wanted to turn it over to Dan just for a couple minutes of comments thanks. on the conversation. Thanks very much. This is great. I'm really pleased. Uh, Isabel, thanks for taking the meeting with me. I was, I was, I've been very interested in this issue for a long time. I think what's interesting about uh, Isabel Hill's job is that in other countries it would be a, a, a cabinet ministry job. And so I think uh, she has a very important role in, in outside of the United States in terms of how, uh, how many other countries think about this as a strategic asset. Spain, Italy, Mexico, Costa Rica. I, I, I note that Ambassador Tony Wayne is here, the former U.S. Ambassador to Mexico. I don't know what percentage of the GMP of Mexico is travel, tourism, and hospitality. I don't know if it's 25%. I don't know if it's 30%. It's as big as the oil industry or bigger, I'm guessing, más o menos. I think it's somewhere there. And is it bigger than is it bigger than the oil industry? It's bigger than the oil industry. So it's a huge deal. Um, I also appreciated Isabel's comment about Iraq uh, and the religious tourism. I think they get something like a couple of things about Iraq and religious tourism. There are more sites referenced in the Bible in the Bible in Iraq than there are, I think, in Israel. I think there's something like this. I'm, I mean, I got to go check my Bible, but there's a lot of there's a lot of biblical stuff in Iraq. A lot. So there's an incredible amount of biblical tourism, but in addition, if you, there are some of the holiest sites in Shia Islam are in Iraq, and so they have massive religious tourism. It's in the millions, I think. I mean, it's a very high number. It's just, you know, we're just not, you know, we're not, they don't have any direct flights from Dulles, so it's, it's not on our radar screen here in Washington, but it's a very big deal. Um, so I just, I have two, um, I have a comment, and then I've got a question for this, this group, which is, okay, so I think, if we think about the youth bulge, one of the things that the people keep that keep people up at night in security in the security world is okay. What are we going to do about the hundreds of millions of young people and how we're going to employ them? Because that's a lot of young people are a lot of energy. That that energy could be used for good or can be used for not so good. And it seems to me one of the largest sectors that needs a lot of jobs that's going to take on there's there's going to be at least 100 million jobs, I think, in the travel, tourism, and hospitality sector that could absorb a whole chunk of the youth bulge. Big answer to the youth bulge problem is this. So I think we haven't fully, I mean, Isabel has, understands this. 
and she's helped me understand this, but I think we haven't as a government fully understood that this is the strategic nature of this in terms of, I mean, you look at some of the big hotel chains, they'll say, they'll talk about the big plans they have in places like Africa for opening hotels. So there's a huge strategic, in addition to China thinking about this strategically, we need to be thinking about how we use travel, tourism, and hospitality to confront the youth bulge issue, because that I think is, it's not the answer, but it's part of the answer. So that's a comment. My question for this group is, we, and Isabel touched on this, but I'd like to hear from the other panelists about the issue of culture, because I think a lot of travel, tourism, and hospitality is interlinked with culture. And so if each of you could just comment on the issue of culture, because I think a lot of travel interlinks with this issue of culture, and I think you know, number of governments like Italy and somewhat Spain, when they think about development cooperation, they say, okay, well, I'm interested in tourism, but I'm interested as it touches or links to culture in some way. So I'd be curious about that. Thank you very much. Chris, you, you touched a little bit on that in, in your, can you dig a little bit deeper for us on the, on the cultural part of what you do? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think, like I mentioned, you know, culture is one of the resources of why people want to visit a destination, whether that's the tangible, the monument, or the intangible, the food, the dance, the music. And oftentimes what we find is communities um, often don't always understand the value of their culture. I mean, they value it themselves, but they don't understand why other people would be interested in learning about the, these things. We've been working in Armenia for the last uh, three years now with Smithsonian Institute through their Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. And it's fascinating because you have uh, this boom happening in Yerevan, but in the rural areas right now, it's not really. So as we go visit some of these monasteries, they're amazing and there's some tourists there, but then you look at the communities, again, not benefiting from that tourism. So we sit down with the, the Smithsonian folks and we work with the community community to try to understand what are their cultural values, what are the things that they are proud about. And then once we understand those and are able to kind of really understand who the cultural bearers are in those communities, we then sit down and say, okay, well, how could this be presented to a visitor? What would that look like from a tourism experience perspective? Whether that's training tour guides or creating a new experience of learning how to make the traditional cheese with the ladies who've been doing this for generations. And But that process of identification and then working through to, as I learned working with Smithsonian, it's not product development, it's cultural representation. Presentation. Um, but being able to do that, it creates such pride in those communities. And obviously there's an understanding as well um, of the diaspora being a big target market of who we're going after. So that whole idea of how do we get the diaspora back to experience this cultural, these cultural values and cultural assets. But I think this idea of, you know, one thing that everyone in every single corner of the world, they have pride in their place. They love who they are. They love where they've come from. And so tourism gives a chance for communities to bring that out and to celebrate that, that culture. And when they have a chance to celebrate, whether it's a local festival or, or just being able to pre prepare traditional food, you can see that pride. And so I think that, that that ability for tourism to kind of help not only um, you know identify, but also present and, and sustain that cultural heritage is really important. And I think it, that's, again, what drives the tourists. I mean, that's why we're going and traveling around the world is because we want to see something different. And culture obviously plays an important role in that. Could you comment just real briefly on how you do that without destroying the, the culture? Right, because I think that's yeah. a big fear that, that people have. Right? So the answer to that is, as the tourism experts, we work very closely with the cultural experts, and we we, we lean on Smithsonian in this aspect, who who really kind of look at what is it that they want to share. Um, in Dogon country in Mali, we were working on a project there where we were trying to help the communities benefit from tourism. They were, no one people were coming, taking pictures, but no one was spending money. So we wanted to help them spend money, but we realized very quickly that the community had sacred dances that they didn't want to share. So it's understanding that understanding, well, what dances would you be willing to share? What would you like to share? And then through that dialogue, we understand this is sacred. This is to us. We don't want to, but this is we have no problem sharing and then working with them to develop that. That makes a lot of sense. And I know, Hannah, uh, I, I want you to comment on this, but I'd also love if you could address Dan's youth uh, question that, that he asked. So two-parter to you, uh, Hannah. Yeah, so I wanted to add, uh, Chris, to your, your quick comments from the standpoint of one of the challenges that you face and that we all face in this regard is that often we are working with communities where people have not traveled very much. And so the whole idea of celebrating their, their culture, their place, um, very much their intangible and tangible assets is very much about helping them to understand what those are and, and celebrate them and then go on from there. Uh, and um, that's all part of the process, which certainly takes time, but contributes to uh, development over time that really takes root. Uh, 
Uh, the, the question on uh, the youth bulge and uh, employment and tourism. One of the interesting things that we found over the years in terms of tourism development, particularly in emerging economies, is that uh, tourism often provides that first job where people are moving from an informal economy to a formal economy. And very often this is um, with younger people and uh, is a way that they often can get more involved beyond, let's say, the family business, but in fact can uh, grow and, and step into a, a bit of a, a path as it relates to as the tourism grows, their opportunities grow, and their, their job experience grows. And their skill set, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And But that's also one of the challenges. Uh, we did quite a bit of work, for instance, in the Gambia, where a number of the um, tourism operators, hotel operators, were training Gambians to be more involved in the tourism sector. In many cases, it was their first formal job which was all um, terrific. And then after a period of time, the hotels kept finding that all these wonderful, bright young people that had learned service standards and were coming along with really uh, developing a, a formalized work ethic were all getting hired by the banks. <laughs> and we're all going to work in the banks because as the banking industry, which is obviously a service-based industry, was growing in Gambia, they kept saying, oh, well, yeah, those folks that have uh, learned how to work in hotels, we can have them come work in our banks. And the trade-off is, is, you know, good news, bad news. Obviously for the hotel folks, it's a bit of a, of a revolving door. Not always, but sometimes it is. And my my sense on that is, is that that's not always so bad because if, if the hospitality and tourism industry can bring people into a more formalized sector through uh, jobs, especially for youth, that can have a real benefit over time, even if those folks go on to other sectors uh, uh, such as, as banking. And then one other element is, is that, we, uh, that we look at tourism as a, a somewhat fragmented industry, but it is really a, a whole bundle of services and experiences, especially in emerging economies, where there are both big corporations and also SMEs and more of an entrepreneurial spirit. And tourism has this incredible ability to energize both and sometimes even be collaborative while they're doing it. And that's where we, we all are, are looking to uh, foster greater collaboration, which in turn leads leads to uh, potential greater employment over time for youth and, and for others. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, Helen, yeah. If, if I could get you to comment, especially from private sector perspective on right. this, generally, but also the private sector. So there's been a, human, uh, <clears throat> a tremendous amount of investment in um, both in engaging the youth into understanding it's a career path, not necessarily, the, it, and many times it is the first job, but also that uh, there's a value for um, being able to take the community in which they've placed their new hotel and or and be engaged from the very beginning. So there's a lot of disenfranchised youth as well as others, uh, including some of the uh, refugees as well as victims of violence, etc. that Merritt Hotels, for instance, has designed programs that would incorporate and bring them in to the hotel to be able to uh, learn and be protected in a sense to be able to find a way to, to recover and be resilient um, and have some sustainability of their own. And then there's um, the youth uh, initiative that uh, was done by the interna um, international ITP, I always forget. National Tourism Partners. Tourism Partners. And 11 hotels had engaged in creating a real training program that directed at the youth in order to bring them into uh, viable employment. Um, I found that in Malta, I was serving on a panel about the human skills gap that we do have and facing the 1.8 billion travelers, how we would meet that demand across the board. And Malta had the exact same experience. It was a huge boom in Malta for, and all of the employment was dedicated so much to travel and tourism. And then as the banks grew and strengthened, they were finding that, oh, wait a minute, these are the best of all. So they really all transitioned over. And I will say, the pay was a lot better. Yeah. So there's a lot of responsibility needed in that as well as to really look at how we're paying and compensating to keep them in and, and or to be competitive. 
Um, and at the same time, I think that it's not just the youth, it's really, um, it's the diversity factor and it's the women entrepreneurs. Peru is such a wonderful example of going out into the communities and, and as you were saying, in their culture, um, helping women create a business out of the craft that they have and have those wares be sold, even if it's along the bus route as you're going down, but also to doing the teaching and, the, and of how they actually make what they're making. Um, and even though the language may be a barrier, it still has uh, the value of being able to give them joy that they're sharing this kind of, and that they're making money in what they're doing. And, and also being able to create a freedom for themselves. So I think in that regard, uh, there are uh, several really highly engaged, Hilton Hotel has a huge entrepreneur program for the disadvantaged youth, and particularly seen, I've experienced it in the UK where I live, and it's commendable. So, that, but it's only this much right now, we have to keep moving. And just last piece, to address what um, Isabel was saying, and even Dan's question, and he's already disappeared, so who in the heck knows if he cares? But, um, you know. <laughs> I'll, I'll relay your answer to him, don't worry. <laughs> No, uh, but in Egypt uh, has been so devastated, and that's a perfect prime example, as well as Turkey, uh, in, in its um, capacity now to even withstand the downturn that's happened through really horrific uh, terrorist attacks, and terrorist attacks that were geared, that were targeted to tourists, which immediately made it vulnerable. And then government policy that can't come back around to help bring the tourists back. So the UK was in a position where they were really having to withhold the British travelers from going a particular air route to Sharm el Sheikh because they were protecting their citizens and they didn't feel that there was enough security rebuilt in order for them to meet the protocol that they would require to send direct routes out. And they were, Egypt was just uh, devastated that they couldn't get them turned around. We, we approached it from an advocacy level and said, what you really need you need to do something because it's the youth we need to protect. They are so vulnerable, they're unemployed, they have no place to go, and they're on the border. They are so vulnerable now to being brought into the, the dark side. So I think that we have to keep a mindset of that and, and be protective and find ways to also ensure that the resilience that can be there is actually addressed by both governments and private sector. John, John, can I bring you into this conversation? I mean, it seems to me that the bank does a lot of funding in this area, and they do a lot of thinking about these types of things, not just about youth, but about skill building, about entrepreneurship. So can I ask you to just reflect on this conversation that we're having right now? Sure. Um, I think uh, we all understand the, the, the issue of the youth bulge and the need to get people in, employed. And we've got a fantastic opportunity in this sector because we've got this perfect supply demand kind of issue right in front of us. But as we all know, making this happen on the ground is, is totally a different story. And it involves multiple sort of parts of government. We're working, as I said, in Indonesia. We're actually working on this skills piece. We're doing that because the government has asked us to make sure that the, the, the normal person in the street can actually engage in this industry a bit more easily than what they're doing now. And part of that is because they don't have the skills. We can measure their, their standard of quality of service and skill level. We do that actually through all the social media. We're partners with people like TripAdvisor and we measure and monitor all that. So what do we find at the end? You need a mechanism uh, to, to actually address that question. And all the goodwill in the world from the Marriott's and the Hilton's of this world, you know, just won't make this happen. You do need a, a public policy position on it. And that position needs to recognise a few things. It needs to recognise that youth do move in and out of this industry. I mean, how many people here worked in some kind of bar or hospitality facility as part of their, you know, their college financing process? You know, I think we all did. You know, did we think we'd have a long-term career in this industry? Probably not. I mean, it was great while the drinks were free, but after that, you know, it became a different sort of story. It was actually hard work. Well, then the folks on this panel then failed, because you, you have made a career in this industry. Uh, we, we took a default to try to be professionals in this. So, you know, the reality is that, it, that you need to have policy that reflects that, that acknowledges that that's the way in which people actually move in and out of the business. But at the same time, 
you need to be able to guarantee the quality and progression through the kind of competency competency based standards that exist or don't exist, the accreditations that are in place or are not in place, the certifications of people to recognise either their prior learning, and it's a it's a very important space for governments and the private sector to, to work together. It kind of doesn't happen. So the bank does do a lot in this space. They they. Uh, we, we were working on, the, on this problem at a number of strategic levels. You mentioned Egypt, Tunisia, you know, all of the Middle East has been through crises like this. We have massive unemployment in the, in the youth group there, and so the bank, you know, addresses this as a more of a generic issue in, in, at that level. But then as you move into, you know, industry sectors where I work, you know, it's, it's obvious that this is a sector that has a, an opportunity to play a big role. But you do have to be able to engage at a level of government where you can influence the kind of structures within which those responses uh, can be delivered. Go ahead, uh, use your mic, so. Okay, there is a regional effort in this, too. So um, there's two issues. There's the mobility of the workforce, and not just upwards, but across, across borders. So ASEAN is a very good example who's taken it and uh, to heart, realizing that their growth is coming so fast, and uh, Indonesia putting four billion is a good example, but they need a workforce to meet it, and, it, and a lot of it is dependent upon the youth. But they've created a cross-the-board certification program so that if I qualify in Cambodia and I want to go to the Philippines, if I've been certified in Cambodia and they're also engaged in using that same certification program, then I can do that. I don't have to have a master's in hospitality, but I've been through the coursework and been able to demonstrate that I have this acumen for performing whatever it is I want to go and do over in the Philippines. So that's another good uh, uh, aspect to consider, for the, particularly for this youth generation that really likes to move about um, if we were to target that. Does that have to be regional or is there like an ISO thing that's a global certification? I mean, is there a role for something like that? Well, it's hard enough to get a standard among the airlines, I can't imagine that. <laughs> and, and which brings up another issue. There are really big uh, deficits coming to play in uh, certain segments, as she said, as she being Hannah. As Hannah said, it, you know, we're a, a collection of industries to make one sector. You think about the air controllers the navigational systems, even the pilots are, are starting to panic. So I think we really need to look at some of the full, very technical careers. And my goal is to get out to the universities and work with the skill set that cross-pollinates with the IT groups, because we are going into this massive IT environment, as we should, and technology is getting more critical in our industry, but nobody ever thinks about applying it to our industry. So we need to get them engaged. Just, to, just Go ahead. Real quick. I think one of the other challenges we have in, in the industry is a PR problem. Most people do not think that a career in tourism and, uh, and travel and tourism yeah. is a good career, um, especially a long-term career. And then especially if you ask the parents, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm working in the mm -hmm. Cayman Islands. No one in the Cayman Islands wants their kids to work in travel and tourism. Mm -hmm. So it's a big issue. Um, I know Jordan Kamonix worked a lot on trying to change people's perspective of what it means to work in the travel and tourism industry. So I would say that that's a big issue that needs to be addressed as well. I, I, I didn't grow up with that because I, I grew up idolizing my dad who was a hotel manager. So uh, I, uh, that's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I didn't really think of it that way. But Isabel? Uh, yeah, one of the things um, I think that, that uh, to Helen's point um, I, that, that perhaps will also give some context to this conversation, um, travel and tourism globally is such a growth industry. Um, it, it grew 7% last year. I mean, that's huge. Um, it is expected to grow 4% you know, per year, and we've already got, what, 1.3 billion people traveling. Um, so, so there is, number one, a great opportunity. I mean, I think that is the, the, the um, part of the message here is, is that we have um, some very new kinds of travelers who are very interested in the kinds of experiences that we are talking about. And that market segment is growing tremendously. Um, but it's, it, the, the, the whole travel and tourism sector is um, uh, growing at exponential uh, rates. And so this question of, of how do we bring in uh, these, these um, uh, least developed economies, how do we learn from the mistakes of the past to, uh, past to do that in the right way that is sustainable? How do we manage the um, 
uh, expectations of travelers. Um, they don't necessarily get to go everywhere they want to go when they want to go there. Um, so I think we, there's also a, a part of this that is about um, how do we uh, sustain this kind of growth in a productive way. And, and, and there's a consumer part of this as well. The consumer p plays a big role in this and a very different role, I think, in the future than they have in the past in the sense that we need a more educated traveler. We need a traveler who understands their role in this process, a, a traveler who is conversant uh, with um, sort of the responsible uh, travel. And, uh, and so I think that is another dynamic of this conversation because we are not going to have successful uh, development. We are not going to be able to capture the value of this growth uh, unless we do it as a, as a global community that way. Digging in on that a little bit, uh, Helen, maybe I can ask you to comment. You're done? We're done? Okay. All right. Hannah. What, no. <laughs> Um, so we have, uh, we've been talking about uh, a number of things. One of the things that was brought up early on was that some countries really strategically prioritize this. This is on their top five list of things that are important. Can you give us um, two or three countries where that's the case and, and maybe uh, tell us a little bit about why they see that as, as a strategic priority as opposed to extractives or, or anything else? So. That was a tough one. Is that yours or mine? H <laughs> Hannah and Helen. I'm going to start. I'll stand back. Because I, I said okay. I wasn't going to just to bust him. I'd make sure that he was staying on point. Um, if I looked at uh, this beforehand, and there were maybe at least 25 countries I know that have made uh, travel and tourism their strategic priority and or region. Uh, Caribbean is obviously quite dependent upon travel and tourism. But a couple of examples is one is Japan. And Japan has used travel and tourism to help um, uh, expand the experience of their, um, of their citizenry, really, to appreciate uh, international differences and in cultures and to have them go out. They spent a lot of time, many years, uh, when I was first at the National Travel and Tourism Office, we had a, a, a relationship to try to bring the travelers out of their country. Now they're very intent. Uh, they've set a robust um, goal of travelers to come in and, and as well as the helping their balance of trade, again looking at it from an economic standpoint, but culturally they have now moved it out to the countryside. So so they are going out into the rural areas and the, some of the real kinds to be able to help educate them on how you can uh, be open to the international tourists that are so interested in experiencing, back to Isabel's point, the, the main driver of tourism now, travel and tourism, is experience. And don't forget the business traveler. They're tagging on the experience after they do their business at hand. The other one I would say... Guilty. Uh, Huh? Yeah, guilty, exactly. I never get the time, but I'm working on it. So um, Vietnam, I thought, was a really good example. Uh, you know, Vietnam has just gone through such throws, and they have finally really taken on travel and tourism as their uh, avenue for uh, both um, uh, expanding their abilities, having the small, medium-sized enterprises, developing their infrastructure into a much more facile area, and also to be able to show that they are open in uh, for all cultures, and they've expanded their abilities with an e-visa. They've uh, done a lot of policy um purposeful policy changes in order to open up their country. And if you think about it, to be able to go to Vietnam as a tourist is, to me, still from the 60s. Don't, I'm, I'm, I'm a little older than you, but um, you were still part of flower child, period. <laughs> And it was, it was an incredible experience just to feel from the heart that I could be there and be surrounded by the Vietnamese people and appreciate both North and South that they were working together. And the last one would be, you know, we were talking about having tourism, travel and tourism be sort of a reconstruction value. And the, in, um, <clears throat> when Clinton was uh, in office here, I don't mean to swear, but when Clinton was here, it was amazing because he had, uh, through Senator Mitchell, uh, who was Irish, wanted to have a trade and commerce forum to help rebuild Northern Ireland. And they had made the Good Friday Agreement and travel and tourism was in that. 
and they wanted to deliver, have the businesses come to the White House and, and meet with counterparts and businesses in Northern Ireland to be able to say, we're going to put ourselves at the table and help you re rebuild. And travel and tourism was the only one, I have to say this because it was a big thing to me, we were the only ones that delivered an actual agreement among the UK partners and Scotland and the Republic of Ireland, all to say, let's sign the MOU to make sure we rebuild. And this country or this part of the UK, the Northern Ireland, is such a valuable um, travel and tourism spot now, and it did help to find the funding to rebuild the reconstructing buildings and roads, but also for the people to be able to deal with each other and the cross-border traffic that became a really critical part. But also, I think they have the Titanic Museum. Hannah's gone there, she'll tell you all about it. And now, I mean, Game of Thrones. I mean, you know, all of a sudden it's burgeoning, and guess what? Brexit happens. <laughs> Talk about geopolitical. Oh, sorry, I'm getting a little uh, agitated. <laughs> but then Brexit happens, and what does that do? That all of a sudden sets the whole barrier thing up again, and that discussion over borders, and nobody wants it. And so this is all on the table now to be negotiated because this happened. It worked, and there we go. That's the end. So, so, Hannah, I guess you're going to tell us about the Titanic Museum. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, that was a really good answer. I don't have anything else to say. No, uh, I, I'd like to share three quick examples here that could be um, uh, useful to us. One is um, the use of, of tourism very strategically in Rwanda. Uh, and this is a great example where uh, the head of the country said tourism is going to be one of our sectors. And you know, following the genocide and, and uh, the, the fragility that went on, a number of folks said, well, you know, what are you talking about? You know, who's gonna go? Well, certainly um, uh, Rwanda has gorillas unlike anyone else, and it's uh, an, an attraction that was uh, they were able to develop in a way that both um, protected the animals, uh, celebrated the animals, but also gave the whole country um, the opportunity to uh, celebrate through the naming of the gorillas and uh, the whole naming ceremony that brings thousands and thousands of people together is, is just an example, but at the same time, a set percentage of the, the revenues that were generated was um, <coughs> sent back into the nearby communities through their nominating specific projects that they wanted to do, and that enabled both communities involvement, but also uh, community benefits over time. And it came primarily uh, through an initial statement that tourism is one of our top sectors that we will uh, use to develop. Namibia is another just very quick example in terms of the um, uh, nature-based conservancies across the country where people in various areas brought together their specific plots of land to develop conservancies. And in some of these, uh, they wanted to be part of the tourism and help develop the tourism and supported uh, joint ventures where Namibians would work in the eco-lodges. And so here you have an opportunity, uh, again, where private sector in combination with uh, public sector policies is helping to um, have impact on the ground. And in 2011, um, they generated about four million uh, U.S. dollars in direct benefits in these various conservancies to uh, local people in in the villages. And in some, by the way, the villagers didn't want to have anything to do with the tourism, and tourism was kept off in an area. They were able to benefit from it, but still go on with their own uh, lives as they wanted to. And one other area that we really haven't touched on is, is certainly the area of, of climate change and what, what's the role of tourism in that? We often think about it from the standpoint of, oh my goodness, you know, uh, tourism is threatened by climate change, but also tourism can be very much a part of some of the new opportunities that we have. Um, St. Kitts and Nevis have done an amazing job of, uh, through a number of sustainable tourism initiatives to um, cut back uh, by about 80,000 uh, gallons per year of fuel consumption uh, in a manner that uh, has helped them in terms of lowering their imports, but has also contributed to their, um, also at the same time, developing solar energy. And I think it's about um, 
uh, a megawatt of energy that is now going, pardon me, going back into uh, the national grid system. So those are three just quick examples of both from the, the resiliency and uh, post-conflict um, in, uh, environment to also the uh, natural resources where tourism can work in a, in a proactive manner and also uh, St. Kitts and Nevis in terms of uh, climate change initiatives. I was in Uganda a few years ago and went to go see the gorillas and they, uh, we talked about marketing before and the, where a lot of the gorillas live is called the Bwindi Impenetrable Forest. <laughs> so talk about, you know, just a marketing bonanza. It's like challenge accepted. Um, I'm going to ask in a few minutes uh, everybody on this um, panel to to think about what are the one or two things that you want folks here to leave with. Um, before we do that, though, I'd like to open it up uh, to the audience uh, for some questions. So maybe we'll start with the sir here and then a uh, ma'am here in the second row. So we're getting, hold on, wait for a microphone if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can stand up. Isabel's going to be walking around with the microphone. That is it. Yeah, and please say who you are and what organization, if you're comfortable doing so, sure. and try to end in a question mark. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, George Dragnich. Uh, I'm a former assistant director general of the International Labor Organization, which does a lot on tourism in that section or that office that did report it to me during my time in Geneva. Uh, I was delighted to hear all the discussion about employment generation, because that's what started the work at the ILO. But then there's also the, the disadvantaged groups that benefit from that are also the vulnerable groups. And I think we have to think of them. We think of, of women, migrants, youth, sadly even children. Uh, so that there's a, op a lot of opportunity for abuse as well, whether it's sexual harassment, wage theft, bonded labor, subminimum wages. So I would urge people to, to think about, at least keep that in, 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 your, in, in your mind. Uh, my question would come to the UNWTO, the UN World Tourism Organization, of which the WTTC is a, is a very active partner, but nobody else is. The UN is not a, uh, the United States is not a member of the UNWTO. It was always very frustrating to me. They do great work. I was the point of contact at the ILO with the, uh, with the UNWTO based in Madrid, and I, I, I'd like to know, maybe Ms. Hill, you could address that. Thank you. Yeah, Isabel, and then maybe Helen also. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, back in the Clinton administration, um, uh, you may recall that, um, I'm sure you do recall very well, that there was a, 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 a conversation that led to um, the elimination of a great deal of funding for international organizations, and in that uh, was the um, uh, UNWTO uh, participation. Um, the, U the UNWTO is a, 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 a terrific organization. I'm glad to report that we work very collaboratively with them. We have a very good relationship with them, uh, although we are not a member. Um, uh, we share our data with them. You know, we, we, we do a great deal together. They've been very open to that uh, partnership. Uh, the financial realities are, however, that depending on the strength of the euro and the dollar at any given point, the cost to the United States government of anywhere between, say, 350 to 500,000 a year uh, is pretty, res you know, substantial. Um, and there are a number of other international organizations that the State Department um, would also like to see join. So we are, we are part of a uh, large uh, community of, um, of people who are looking at, at a relatively small pot of money, and the State Department, uh, you know, has to prioritize those. Um, so that's, as far as I know, uh, it's just, as you said earlier, it's money, honey. <laughs> <laughs> it is money, honey. Helen, uh, briefly. Yeah, just briefly. I think that, uh, I think you should know yeah. that uh, from 1996, when the contract for America closed the U.S. Travel and Tourism Administration, and with that, a lot of this kind of funding for the international organizations went with it. And I can tell you, I was the loudest voice in the room fighting this, and for years after, and then carried on by Isabel. Uh, when I left. But the point is that <clears throat> this organization has always been wanting and inclusive of the United States perspective, opinion, and expertise. So they have been de facto at the table. We can't vote, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about the voting. It's about the, what you can participate in the development. 
Second, <clears throat> to address your other issue, the dark side of our industry and the facility that we can provide to help bring light to helping and protecting both on the trafficking, the vulnerable, bringing in the migrants, I addressed that earlier, and also with the refugees, but the child protection. So in WTTC, I'm sitting on a high-level task force right now uh, as a result of a, a two-year global study with 67 partners, private sector and government, on the sexual exploitation of children in travel and tourism, specifically a UN study, uh, was actually funded by the Netherlands. But the bottom line is that now we're in the implementation and it's wider than just sexual exploitation. And today, later today, the Marriott International is going to be up at the Congressional Visitor Center signing the code for ECPAC, which is the Child Protection and Trafficking um, UN uh, organization, to be able to ensure that all of their people are trained by 2025, 100%, and they're the largest uh, hotel you right now, in identifying and dealing with child trafficking and beyond. But I think this is an astounding step forward and we're engaged in how to implement. So thank you for raising that because I had that as one of my notes I wanted to bring, but he didn't ask me. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's really important that uh, we, we're going to fire the moderator after this. So. <laughs> and I didn't plug that one. Uh, thanks. We're going to bundle um, two or three questions. So the the Madam here in the front, and then maybe we'll take the lady right behind her, and then the lady yes. right behind her. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for all your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Seguero International Group. I focus on, I come from Kenya. How many of you have been to Kenya? Sawa, sawa. Mr. Yes. Mr. Chris, you hosted the Kenya at the, food, uh, at the Fox Lift. Tourism. Uh, let's talk about just what you have said. In, we want inclusion, looking at the women, people with disability, the civil society, and everybody into tourism. Tourism, I've done it, and I'll be going to, to Thailand, and my topic will be tourism in, for lo with the local government in Thailand. So how do we make this happen, inclusion? When all these tourists come, there's one thing they don't miss in those countries, food. Food, which I focus on, agriculture. One of my favorite so topics. How do we, yes. Any tourist anywhere cannot stay just walking from morning till evening without taking food. Where does the food come from? The women work for this food in the farms. So all of you, the organization, the tours, the hotels, you need to support me and give me some money to help <laughs> the women in the yeah. rural area, the food they eat in tours. Yeah, these are, these are great points. I attend World Bank annual meetings. This uh, uh, spring, I'm talking about tourism at the civil society. Let's talk and see, come and listen to my presentation on tourism <laughs> at the civil society. So how do we work together? Yeah. The woman, the disability, civil society, military, and the culture. Now the Chinese go in the rural areas, they speak my language. There is no terrorism in Africa. The terrorism are youth. The youth are fighting because they have no jobs. So if yeah. you have that, include them. Let them be part of what you are doing and talk their language. They'll not kill you. They'll not be terrorists. So this yeah. is the main thing. Work with me, all of you, and we can make Africa just as good as um, we are making America. <laughs> so, good. Thank you. Uh, asante sana. Asante. We, uh, we will, um, so inclusive growth, a little bit of the food, which we didn't touch on before. So again, I'm going to bundle uh, two or three questions here. So the, the lady right behind. Hello, um, thank you for your presentations and your question. Um, Elizabeth Becker, I'm standing up for the media. We do, you mostly get 100% favorable articles and every once in a while, yes we do. Look at some of the problems and I'm the author of Overbooked, the Exploding Business of Travel and Tourism, which has over there. It's 2018, we're in Washington, D.C. I just attended a conference in Canada, which was the very first mainstream tourism conference for that country on sustainability. Number one constant was climate change. Almost simultaneously here in Washington, an ad hoc industry group created a coalition to improve the reputation of the United States in the travel and tourism with the said that it's not political, it's only marketing, but they're gonna send 
videos how welcoming the United States is, tolerant and diverse. I think there's a big political piece right now. The United States is having an issue. I don't have to go in it with you guys. And it's also turning its back on climate change, getting out of the Paris Accords and um, getting rid of regulations meant to mitigate. How do you, as a very important industry, address this political issue here in the United States? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and then the lady behind, and then I'll turn to the panelists. Thank you. Hi, this is Sh I'm Sharon Vezin from the International Youth Foundation. And we work uh, with Hilton, um, among others, partners of theirs on the ground, uh, doing a lot of work around uh, youth and employment. And one of the things that I think we're seeing is, and I think this was excuse me, touched upon by, by Helen and echoed uh, to an extent by, by my um, fellow uh, uh, joiner here. Um, and it's the issue of how are some of the, the big players in this industry using their supply chains to elevate um, some of the, the most marginalized. And I think we're, we're really interested in learning more about that. So I'm wondering if you have examples that you can share about how some of the large players are, are doing that to kind of advance a, um, you know, the, the agenda um, of, of development. That's an excellent question. Three really, really uh, great questions. So we had one on inclusive growth, um, food, agriculture, and a whole host of other things. Um, we had a climate change question that was really, I think, very important. Uh, and then we had a, a good question on supply chain. So I think the best way is we're just going to go down the line and, and pick which one or ones uh, you would like to address. And so, uh, Isabel, would, would you like to start? Uh I think, uh, let, let me be uh, clear about my own uh, position. I am a civil servant and not uh, a member of the administration, so I can't speak to administration policy. Um, what I can say, though, is, uh, Elizabeth, you and I have known each other for a long time, and uh, it's been a very interesting question over time, this question of engaging uh, the dialogue on sustainability and travel and tourism in the US. And I would say that um, my observation is that the, in the United States, this, the, the, the practices of sustainable con consumption and production um, happen at the level of the firm. And you know, we have like uh, amazing examples of hotels and, um, and, and other companies that really driving, uh, not for issues of social uh, benefit, but because it, 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 it is uh, helpful to their bottom line. Um, you know, they, uh, US companies were the people who began the business of not um, uh, cleaning your uh, sheets, et cetera, et cetera. And the language of sustainability has not been part of what they're about. If you want to know about that in the United States, I found you go and look at inside the companies in the engineering departments, and they know a great deal about this, uh, not necessarily their government affairs people. Um, so you're asking specifically about the connectivity of the industry. And I do think that with respect to the industry, and I know, um, oh, Patricia just left, but the U.S. Travel Association is represented here. Um, I think that in a sense from the private sector, the industry is catching up in the United States with the rest of the world in terms of the language that they are applying and their awareness, and I'll turn it over to Helen because Helen's organization represents a lot of these, um, of these companies. How that translates into um, the dialogue on climate change, I think, uh, remains to be seen. Okay, I'll go back to my first comment about how tourism is going to happen. It is going to happen. It's a question of whether it's managed and how it's channeled and harnessed to be able to achieve the objectives that we all have. And where, to answer those questions, how do we create a more inclusive tourism industry? How do we address climate change? How do we in integrate supply chains? That comes from a effort that has to take place. It's not just going to happen on its own. Um, businesses, as much as I love the private sector, I love, uh, I, I have my own hotel now, so I'm in this camp. But the reality is we're trying to make ends meet. We're trying to make a profit. We're trying to keep the doors open. We're trying to figure out how to get that next booking. And that's going to be the case no matter what. And, and what's ha what is required 
is someone to be able to, and oftentimes this is where policy comes in from the government, to say, you know what, we as a country, we want an inclusive tourism industry. And we're asking our private sector partners to help us. Be part of our work. I'm, I have, my hotel's out in Culpeper, rural Virginia. I'm working with the economic development officer there to see how we can pro source things from local farmers. Well, I can only do that because there's an economic development officer there helping me and making those connections. If that didn't exist, I'm going to do whatever is the easiest for me to do in order to buy the, the produce that's needed. So my point here is that that policy really is going to, to stipulate that this is the type of tourism we want in our destination, and we want it inclusive, we want everyone benefiting, and here's the role the private sector can play in order to help us do that. And what I found from the private sector is they're willing to step up when given the invitation to do so, but again, it can't be for them to figure it out. And a lot of times that's why these development projects are so great, because it kind of channels and helps the private sector understand how they can create a more inclusive or more sustainable um, type of value chain. Excellent. Um, for the uh, value chain part or the food, uh, the gastronomy and coming to Kenya and, and experiencing the food, as you say, the <clears throat> one of the issues that happens in the supply chain is that the producers that are the uh, in the local production don't necessarily have the same uh, protocols that the Hilton might require because they're a U.S.-based company that has to follow this regimen of the health laws and stuff. So they now have gotten engaged in helping move that forward so that they could understand how we could get that in, uh, the food, the local food in, and wanting to. And I think that uh, within that um, perspective, you should know that gastronomy has been declared the year of gastronomy, I think, for UNWTO. It is taking its own value of way beyond the country's uh, heritage of what kind of foods they're putting. Peru is now the top chefs in Europe. So that they're bringing the food out of the country to p experience. So people wanting to come into the country in order to see how it's really done. And I think we address the inclusiveness with the women entrepreneurs and the kind of advantages that this can provide in value and respect to be given to the providers. Um, I do want to address a little bit on the climate change for uh, Elizabeth because um, I think Isabel's point is really well taken. It's not these companies, and I'm t saying from the airlines, they have set their own market-based measurement initiative in order to address this, for instance. It's not going to be just one country. It's a collection of countries. And it, it isn't stopping the um, some of the companies from being able to hold forth on what needs to be done, and they're going to go ahead and do what is being required in order to be able to stave off some of the, uh, even in the building of hotels, some of the, uh, what was the old style to the new style to be respectful and try to minimize the impact on climate change. Um, and in that respect, in the supply chain mechanism, uh, I know that TUI will not, um, is a huge tour operator in our industry, and uh, they're based in Europe, but they will not deal with anybody as a supplier all the way down to the lowest, smallest chain in business unless they follow their, what they say is their principles for sustainability and sustainable practices. So from that perspective, that's what it takes. And more companies are coming on board to value that, and more companies are coming on board to recognize the inclusiveness uh, need across the board. So that would be Which sort of gets to the supply chain question as well. I mean, they're interrelated uh, questions. So, John? Well, look, I think it's a good uh, point to pick up. Uh, Chris and Helen have both mentioned that the private sector is moving much more rapidly into this, into this space, and it makes all the sense in the world for a couple of reasons. One is it usually has a positive effect on the bottom line, but the other is, hello, it's the private sector that actually delivers the industry. Mm -hmm. If they're not doing it, all the regulation in the world isn't going to kind of uh, like that. change that. <clears throat> so, you know, what does that mean in, in terms of where somebody like us, us can fit in? We can tend to, you know, impact on policy. We can certainly ask uh, companies, uh, co governments, etc., to look at regulations. You know, the IFC, the private sector arm of the bank, has, you know, a billion dollars worth of direct investment in the tourism industry. About half of that is in hotels. And uh, some of those where we have direct relationships with some of these companies that you're mentioning. 
But again, it's a question of influence. In, a, in the case of IFC's investments in hotels, our client, the partner in the transaction, is not the hotel management no. company. It's an owner. Yeah. So it's, there's a step removed from that, and that's not an excuse. It's just that there are other ways in which we can, we can influence that. At the same time, in many developing countries, environmental regulations that impact on items like, uh, like climate change, in many cases, are absent. So how do we protect ourselves, our own investment in this? We have our own sort of massive and sometimes almost impossible to comply with standards in relation to everything from environmental impacts through to social impacts and control of some of these uh, less than desirable processes that, that, we, that we hear. Another role of the bank, though, I think can play in this, and it's an essential role in bringing the public and the private partners together, is in analysis of what's really going on. Chris, Chris touched on a very important point. You know, you can have every hotel management company in the world trying to do the right thing, but at the, some, at the end of the day, the person who's buying the product and who has to price just how much the tomato cost to put on that plate for that meal, if they move outside the margin tolerances for their department, they're going to get fired. That's the end of their career. So they have very little room to move. And so when our board has been telling us year after year, you know, we have to have these hotels buying more and more, you know, local product, particularly in the Caribbean. You know, it's OK, why, why isn't that happening, you know? Well, apart from the fact that, you know, the food and beverage executive director, you know, it's much easier for them to pick up the phone and order from, you know, uh, Fort Lauderdale than it is to get it from, you know, Castries in St Lucia or someplace. The reality is that they don't have a lot of options, right? All of the production time of the year is not at the same time that tourists are in town. And I think we also need to see those discussions in a broader context. Are tourists the only people that eat food in the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. No, the whole food supply industry is set up for whatever the geography is there. So if you're going to influence that, all of the research that we've done in trying to build these linkages shows that it's not often only just the production of the raw material that's the problem. You know, there are no distribution systems that work, mm -hmm. no intermediaries, no aggregators who can bring that product to market at the right time. So the bank can do a lot of research in trying to uh, ensure that those uh, uh, market failures are firstly identified, secondly quantified, and then look for partners who can, who can uh, work to fill them. Uh, we have a series of investments in hotels in Africa. One of the countries, uh, companies that we work with there is a company called Azali. Azali has started off with one hotel when we invested with them. They now have seven or eight mainly in West Africa. They also have a very other, another very interesting company, a provisioning company, a company that they've formed, that we're an investor in, that addresses this very matter of trying to buy properly from various uh, SMEs and bring those SMEs up to a standard that will meet the, you know, the international quality regulations, et cetera, which is a fantastic kind of you know, initiative from that particular investor. We're very happy to support that. But there, there needs to be a lot more of that. And, and within the bank, we're talking a lot more now about, well, you know, is it only just hotels we should be investing in? Or should we also be investing in the supply chain structure that actually ensures that these linkages can be, can be strengthened? So I think there's plenty of room for, for, more, for more development of that. And the bank has a kind of interesting role here. Where it, it, you need to deal with the, the commercial realities of the, of the businesses that you're dealing with. And, and the bank can do the research, I think, that helps governments then sort of and create a, a regulatory framework that ensures that that's supported. See, it's all Hannah? about the money, honey. It's all about the money, honey. <laughs> We're back to the money, Hannah. honey, honey. Um, just very quickly, uh, I think, uh, Elizabeth, just to, to follow up on your, your query in terms of sustainability, um, I think it really comes in part from both um, the increased awareness, whether it's at the corporate level, at the uh, government level, at the guest level, and um, Part of that is, is that each of those uh, entities, if you will, taking uh, responsibility and stepping up to it. And in the case of, of businesses, it's going to have to make good business sense. But where the the consumer really can uh, vote with their feet and and really make some have some impact over time, whether it's who they travel with or where they go. And one other element about sustainability, and this comes back to what uh, Helen was mentioning a little bit earlier in terms of over tourism, it's not just 
just uh, uh, too many tourists, it's too many tourists in too few places. Now, I'm not suggesting that you, know, you spread tourists everywhere, but looking at opportunities for dispersion where there is greater ability to implement um, better sustainable practices can really help, uh, I think, mitigate over time and contribute to uh, tourism being more, more sustainable. I think we can look to, to Canada as being a, a wonderful leader in this way. They've been a leader in many ways in terms of monitoring and evaluating tourism, in terms of their having um, the, the event that they have. I'm, I'm not surprised, and I hope that we can learn from it more here in the U.S., but also in terms of global organizations uh, following some of their lead to make sure that it is um, the, the thoughts around sustainability, the practices around sustainability, and also the education of sustainability can really be uh, integrated globally. I'm cognizant of the time, and I, and I um, want you to come back, so I want to end uh, relatively briefly. I'd like to ask at the end of panels, if you, want, if, uh, if you want the audience to leave with one thing, think tweet le uh, length. Oh, um, right now, you know, Twitter extended to 280 characters from 140, so it can be a little bit longer, maybe two sentences. Just a couple quick things for me, that tourism provides a first job for a lot of people. One in 10 jobs globally are in the travel and tourism industry, and it's 10% of global GDP. It's a 7% growth. Uh, this is a growth industry. This is a big deal. We need to be paying a lot more attention to it. So, Isabel? Thank you. Um, well, I hope that this conversation has um, uh, it opened maybe some eyes to the travel and tourism sector in terms of its potential as one of the many tools uh, available to us in terms of um, creating a better world. I would say that <clears throat> I hope you all leave knowing that tourism is a powerful tool for development, but it has to be managed. It has, there has to be policy to guide that development to ensure it meets the development objectives. I would say from the World Travel and Tourism Council and the private sector perspective, the uh, travel and tourism industry is without question an, um, an engine for growth, uh, an engine for inclusiveness, and most of all, an engine and force for good and peaceful uh, acclimation between economies. So that was probably over 140 words, but uh, I would say that we need to continue to see it as the serious business that it is and the social benefits that it brings. That was only 140. That was great. <laughs> Well, I guess building on what I've just heard, um, what I would be arguing for is to hope that you would go away with an understanding that uh, because of its complexity, but also because of its fantastic reach, this industry needs to be taken very seriously by the top levels of government. And our experience certainly has been when that happens, when you've got a president or a vice president driving this, you get much better buy-in. <laughs> just like when the boss says do it, when we tried to reform you know, what the bank was doing in tourism, we learnt very quickly the smart way was to get the president on board, mm -hmm. not the country managers. Mm -hmm. Hannah? I'll keep mine short. <laughs> tourism is serious business. Tourism is resilient. And it is very much a, uh, a tool for economic, social, and environmental um, activity, uh, both in established economies, emerging economies, and also in uh, post-conflict fragile economies. It's not just about tour buses. It's about many other activities that uh, flow through the economy. Please join me in thanking the panelists.